Hello again from Salem Primitive Baptist Church. Uh, tonight from our living room here in Greenbrier. I want to welcome everybody and hope everybody gets tuned in. Again, being Bible study, I very much encourage everyone to comment and to share and to take part. The the more involved everyone else is, the better it is. Uh, I want to encourage everyone to comment, and ask questions or otherwise as we go through tonight. I do have a couple of prayer requests. I want everyone to be continuing to pray for the situation with the, the virus. While the cases seem to be slowing, there's still an uptick of the cases in the state, a very large uh, rise today, unfortunately. In our county, we've seen a little bit of an increase over the last few days, still not back to the peak we had a couple of weeks ago, but uh, a little bit of an upkick of the cases, some of that due to the faster testing, but there's something to continue to be in prayer for. I know no one needs reminded of the situation but we always need to be reminded and be mindful to be always in a mind of prayer and seeking the Lord's face in situations like this. So I want everyone to please continue to be in prayer and remember one another and reach out and help any way that we can. I'd like everyone to continue to pray for my coworker's nephew, uh, Corey Page, that was involved in the horse riding accident. Uh, he is progressing. He's still got a long way to go. He has, uh, thankfully, he has body movements with all four extremities. He's got hands, feet, arms, legs, everything is moving. He's got facial expression. Uh, he is going to have to completely learn how to talk again, though. He's still pretty well mute but still has a long ways to go. The swelling on his brain is going down. Everything's looking good, So, but continue to be in prayer for him. Remember that there are, there are medical situations and personal situations in everyone's life beyond the virus. It's very important for us to not get tunnel vision just with the virus situation in the world and forget that everyone else exists. Uh, please be in prayer for everyone. Uh, we have Sister Phyllis of our church that has type B flu and bronchitis. Thankfully, nothing beyond that. But either way, still sick, feel, uh, feeling bad. Um, wife Brandy is saying she's talked to her today and she is feeling some better, but continue to be in prayer for her. Uh, Continue to pray for Brother Jim and Sister Beverly and their situation. Uh, just encourage everyone to be in prayer. If there's any other prayer requests tonight, I encourage you to put them in the comments. I'll go back and look over them, and they'll always be in our prayers through the week ahead. I'd like to go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we... We thank you once again for the ability to do this. We thank you, Lord, for the burden and the desire to be able to go to your word and to gather together, even in the virtual world, Lord. I'm thankful for the, the opportunity to do this. I pray, Lord, that you're with us tonight. I pray that you remember all those that are on our hearts and minds and forgive us, Lord, of those that we forget. Lord, I, I desperately seek that you be with this virus situation and help it to stop and help it to go away in a way that everyone knows it's you and not just natural happenings, Lord. Just uh, be with us in a mighty way and lift up everyone that's involved. Be with the emergency workers there that are on the front lines, Lord. Be with the medical staffs and be with the leaders of this nation and help them to overcome uh, political differences and just focus on trying to follow your will and the design for this country, Lord. 
do ask again, Lord, that you open your word to us tonight, help us to learn from it and glean some wisdom that might be able to help us in our lives and the lives around us. Be with the church and all of your congregations and your ministers that they may uh, speak your truths, Lord, and be with the congregations that they may hear and that they may continue to gather together. And Lord, haste the day that we can be back in your house to worship as we should. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins and failures. And above all things, I ask that you bend us to your will. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, again, I want to thank everybody for being here with us tonight. Uh, if you've got your Bible there, I ask that you start off going to the book of Joshua. Book of Joshua is going to be the first uh, text we actually go to in Scripture to read. Um, I have some thoughts on my mind tonight. They're, they may be uh, kind of peculiar, but I hope that everyone can uh, follow my train of thought and, and get some blessing out of it. I have there again on the screen tonight, I've shared the slides so everybody can keep up, everybody can read along. And everybody knows where everybody's at, even if you come back to this later. Again, we've got our YouTube page up and going that I will share this video to. Uh, so I encourage you to go back to it, read it uh, watch it again, read it, study it, consider it in the days ahead, and share it with others. And it will, of course, always be on our Facebook page as well. Tonight, I'd like to look at uh, parting words are charges for life. As I've got there on the screen for you to look at, Scripture is full of many words of wisdom. And that kind of goes without saying. But when we consider the Bible, we can get lost in what it is and, and overlook the blessing of having it. I don't want us to have a view of Scripture that if I can have a little bit of liberty with it, that we don't have such a high and holy look at it that we forget that it's a lesson for us in our daily lives. Uh, scripture is absolutely inspired by the word, inspired by God himself, breathed by God. It is an absolute holy thing. It's to be reverenced. It is to be looked at highly and holy. But it's also good for us to remember that it, it's just a good book to read. It's enjoyable. There, there's a lot to be found in it. And there's a, an endless source of words of wisdom in Scripture. Even if you were to remove the holy and the, the God side of it, even the world would recognize and does recognize the moral value found in Scripture. But Scripture is full of many words of wisdom. It's part of its riches and its beauty. Many of them, as I have again on the screen there, many of them uh, we quote and we, rec we can recognize from a mile away. From great one-liners like pray without ceasing. One of the easiest verses out there to memorize. But that's, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17 simply states, pray without ceasing. Uh, what a wonderful lesson, what a beautiful thing to know and understand that we should always have a spirit of prayer. In a time like this, uh, you know, so many people say they've taken God out of X, Y, or Z. They've taken God out of the courthouse. They've taken God out of the, out of the schools. They've taken God out of the workplace. I know everybody says that <clears throat> because they've taken the time and the moment that we've put aside publicly to pray, but the reality is, is the only one that can remove God from any of those places are the Christians. We can always be in a spirit of prayer. I pray in the courthouse, if I'm ever there. I pray at work. I prayed when I was in school, uh, especially on test day. The, the only one that can remove God from those places are the people that carry him there. So it's wonderful that Scripture has those quick little one-liners that we can all memorize and remember. But there's also those amazing 
sermons and speeches that are in there, like the Sermon on the Mount, one that everybody knows and recognizes there in Matthew 5 through 7. The study of Scripture will take you through lives of through the lives of many amazing men of wisdom. God inspired them to leave behind beautiful lessons for us to try to follow and to learn from. Some of my favorites of all the the messages that are left behind, uh, of the stories that are here, of the things that we are to, to glean from and to pick up from, some of my favorites are the charges recorded in Scripture. Uh, one one great way to consider Scripture. Have you ever, in in your time and your thoughts, wanted an opportunity to have just a one on one sit down with Abraham, or maybe to have a one on one sit down with Moses, or Paul, or Peter? One of my favorites. Or how about to just have a one-on-one sit down with Jesus? An opportunity to, to ask them questions and to learn more from them. Well, that's what we have in Scripture. That's what's recorded in Scripture is a perfect God-inspired, perfect inspired interview with each one of these men. We have first eye, first person account of all of these that we can go back and read and we can spend that time learning from Moses, from Abraham, from Peter, from Paul, and from Jesus himself. And it's just like they're sitting right there with you. You have that opportunity and though that ability to do that from the beauty and the depth of Scripture. And some of my favorites, again, are the charges, the, the deathbed confessions as some would put it, the final words. These parting words were typically directed towards a specific person or a group of people. But as Paul tells us, again, they're on the screen, as Paul tells us in Romans 15 and 4, they were written for our learning. God inspired these men to to make these speeches and these charges and inspired them to be recorded perfectly in Scripture for our learning and for our better understanding. Some of the most memorable times are these parting words, these final uh, points that they try to make. And I want to try to look at three of those tonight. I want to try to look at three of these parting charges to live by. So I've pulled the first one up there on the screen, and we have that there in Joshua chapter 24. This is the first one I want to look at tonight. Joshua 24, starting in verse 14. It says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which were your fathers, <clears throat> which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. I want to give you the context of where we're at here. In Joshua 24, we're, we've come to, we're told at the beginning of the 24th chapter, this is after uh, Israel has been at rest for a long time from their battles. This is after Israel has come up out of Egypt from God's hands. Uh, They've come up, God has brought them up out of Egypt. They've made it through the wilderness, uh, the 40 years lost there in the wilderness, uh, tossed to and fro, uh, wandering about. They've crossed over the River Jordan. 
They've gone into the promised land and they have conquered just as God told them they would. Uh, Though fear held them back the first time, they were willing to cross over and go in the second time and God had provided for them to conquer just as he promised they would. And now this is at the end of Joshua's life. They've been at peace for some time now. They've ceased from their battles and their warfares. They've divided the land amongst themselves as God has directed them. And Joshua realizes, as Scripture says, he was old and stricken in years. He was an old man. He was coming to the end of his life. And he had watched throughout his life this congregation of people learn to serve God. And he knows that he, being the leader, is fixing to pass away, and he wants to charge the people of Israel for their future. A charge is to to load you up. It's to to give you direction. It's to it's an inspiring speech. And that's what he's attempting to do here. So he comes to the end of his life and he basically tells them, choose you this day what you're going to do. Are you going to serve the gods that your father served on the other side of the flood or those that were in Egypt? Or are you going to serve those of the Amorites that you just finished destroying? And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, which did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drave them out from before us, all the people, even the Amorites which dwelt in the land. Therefore we will, or say, therefore will we also serve the Lord, for he is our God. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If ye forsake the Lord, and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he hath done you good. He comes to the end of his life and he's going he's gonna to charge them up. He, he's challenging them. I've got here on the handout for everyone to look at to kind of get the context of Joshua and who he is and how he had gotten to this point. And everything that he had tried to teach and what he is continuing to try to teach. The first time we see Joshua recorded in in a high standpoint is in the book of Numbers, chapters 13 and 14. Now, we're not going to go and read all of those chapters. We don't have enough time for that tonight. But I encourage you to go back and look at them. This is where you'll find recorded in the life of Israel while they were in the wilderness And they had come to the River Jordan the first time, and they sent the spies, the uh, elders of the 12 tribes. And Joshua and Caleb were among those. They were the elders of of their tribe. And they went into into the Promised Land, into Canaan. And when they had sought the country out and saw everything that was there, they came back and gave report to Israel before they were to cross over the River Jordan, and two out of the 12 said, we can do it. Two out of the 12 said, never mind that there's giants. Never mind that they're like grasshoppers. There's so many of them. If God says that we can do this, God will see to it that we can do this. And one of those two is Joshua. You see him there in Numbers 13 and 14 being one that stands in faith and stands trusting 
in God to do what he has promised. He is referring back to that here in Joshua 24. Uh, one of my favorite points of this and thoughts in looking at this is the beauty of the gospel that is taught here in Joshua 24. He's very much lining out, just as the gospel does, how it is that God has taken us out of our bondage. Uh, all of mankind was trapped and bound in sin, including God's people. Left to ourselves, we are no different from anybody else. Left to ourselves, uh, we are trapped in the bondage of our sin, just as Israel was trapped in the bondage of Egypt, and God brought them out in mighty, miraculous ways. Uh, Joshua, being one that was old enough to see even that, uh, after this point when they rejected and they wouldn't go in, all of that generation passed away except for Joshua and Caleb. They were old enough to see is Israel come out of Egypt. They had seen everything that God had done for them and the mighty, miraculous, absolutely irrefutable ways God had been with them. And Joshua remembers this and he tells them, we can go into Canaan. We can go in and fight against these people. We can overcome the giants and all of these people that are here, but Israel refused. They allowed fear to overcome. So not only had Joshua been old enough to recognize God's work, he was old enough to recognize mankind's tendency to let themselves get in the way of God. I, th that's why I love these charges, these parting words that are recorded in Scripture, because you get to see the whole life of the man of God come to this one point. And, and I want to get to one central point on all three of these, and you can see a thread that continues on, and it's truly a charge for us to live by. So we see that Joshua is a man of faith, we see that Joshua succeeds um, Moses. He succeeds behind him. He replaces Moses as the leader. Uh, Moses uh, fell because he smote the rock the second time instead of speaking to the rock as God had told him to do. And when he had uh, committed that sin, God told him because of that, you will not go into the promised land. You'll die this side of Jordan and Joshua is the one that succeeds behind him. And it's recorded in this chapter, the life he has led here in Joshua 24, and he relates it to the people. On his exit, he is charging the people to continue on as he leads. Again, we, we can recognize that Joshua understands that he's old and stricken in years, and he is about to leave, and he has seen... Israel and mankind's tendency to fall back. Yeah, to not follow through. Now, I know none of us are guilty of that. That's right. Real good intentions and no follow through. None of us would ever be able to relate to that, would we? No, none of us can relate to what Joshua is saying here. I don't think that Joshua doubts that Israel is good, has great intentions when he comes to them here and he sa tells them, you have two choices. I mean, let me put it to you just plainly. Joshua comes to the end of his life here. He gathers everyone together. We're recorded here in Joshua 24. He gathers all of Israel together and he tells them, you have two boxes to choose. Over here you have... God, the true God, the God that has taken you up out of Egypt. Remember where you were at. Remember where your parents were. Remember, this is the second generation. They had watched their parents die in the wilderness. Remember where your parents were. Remember how they were trapped and bound. Over here, you have the God that actually got them out of that. 
mm-hmm. this current generation to see the parting of the River Jordan? River Jordan, yes. yes. They're fixing to. Well, no, they had. Sorry, they had. Mm-hmm. Yes, they had seen River Jordan. So that this generation still. Yes. Okay. Yeah, this generation had seen God work in the same mighty way, mm-hmm. but that that's where he's at. Box A, God. That's brought you up out of Egypt, that protected you through the wilderness, that parted the River Jordan as you came over into the Promised Land, just like he did the Red Sea. It's a beautiful picture how he continues on to show everybody. He has been with you through all the battles. You've seen the sun stand still. You've seen walls fall that have no reason to fall. You've seen... Uh, 10 turn away thousands. You've seen God work. You've seen giants fall. You've seen us be able to conquer just as God said. And over here you have box B. In box B you have the gods of Egypt that could not do everything God did. They tried to and for the first couple of the miracles and the plagues their magicians were able to do it. But after about the third or fourth one they couldn't repeat what God was doing. You've seen those gods fail. Mm -hmm. You've seen the gods of Egypt fail. You've seen Pharaoh and all of his soldiers die. In this same box, you have the gods of the Amorites. They're just as dead and useless as the ones that fell in Egypt. So you've got the choice. God or the gods. Because you're going to serve somebody. The reality is, is we are going to serve something. As much as mankind wants to think that they are self-willed and have free will and do whatever, uh, we serve something, whether it's God, whether it's money, whether it's self, whether it's following somebody else, we all serve something. Joshua tells them, choose today. I'm leaving. There's no shortage of evidence like I've got there on the hand on the screen. The choice is ours to make. This is where I want us to relate the charge to ourselves. The choice is ours to make. There is no shortage of history or evidence in the present. We've got perfect, holy, inspired word of God, the full revelation of God. We've got far more evidence than even they had, and they had seen the sun stand still and seen the waters part and giants fall, and we've got an even more perfect recording than what they had even seen. The, the history of God working, that let me bring it personal to today. This is not the first plague to hit this world. This is not the first pandemic to hit this world. And guess what? Humanity survived. The church survived. And God's still on his throne. And when we get through this one, the church will still be here. Humanity will still be here. And God will still be on his throne. There's nothing new under the sun. There's no shortage of God working throughout history. There's no shortage of evidence in history, and there's no shortage in my own personal life. And if we were to take time to study it out in our own hearts and minds, I would challenge any of you to say that there's no evidence in your own life that God is not real and on his throne. I believe that we've all seen him at one time or another. So now, let me leave you with Joshua's challenge and his charge. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Who will we serve? Is that a charge for you? Is that a challenge? We have the same choice today as Israel had. And Joshua sought to charge Israel with that. And it's recorded for us to be challenged with it today. The next one I want us to look at 
is in 1 Kings chapter 2. First Kings chapter two, starting in verse one. It says, now the days of David drew nigh that he should die. And he charged Solomon his son saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong therefore and show thyself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. Now again, we find David here at the end of his life. 1 Kings 2, 1 and 3, we have David charging Solomon, his son. We all know and recognize King David. I think we would all recognize him well. He's one of those people in Scripture that everybody knows. Most everybody in, that has ever studied Scripture remembers Joshua 24 of choose you this day whom you will serve, but how much of Joshua do you know and really taking time to study him? Everybody knows the name of David. Uh, he's recorded in Scripture as being a man and a king after God's own heart. That's right. We're told in Scripture that God chose David. The first king of Israel what came at Israel's own demand. They did not request a king. They went to God and demanded a king. Said, we want to have a king just like everybody else does. That doesn't sound familiar, does it? Everybody else is doing it. It's got to be good. Well, the first king was a flop. He failed. He did exactly what God said he would do. And no surprise to that, God knows far better than we do. The second king was chosen by God. <clears throat> and that was David. And we're told that he was a king and a man after God's own heart. Uh, the prophet himself didn't recognize it any. Yeah. He looked at... He looked at all the other brothers and said, this has got to be him. He's head and shoulders above them all. And God said, nope, that's not him. And they go through all the brothers and all the lineage there and, and can find none. And God says, it's this one over here. He was ruddy and of a fair countenance. He's a pretty boy. One that nobody looked to and said, that looks like a king. Uh, we can see <clears throat> right there on the handout that he is a, a king after God's own heart, and God had been with him since his youth. It's recorded in Scripture uh, from, we have more of David's young life than we have of Jesus' young life. And that's, that's saying a lot. There's only just a couple of verses in Scripture about Jesus' life prior to being around age 30, but there's actually quite a lot recorded of the life of David from being quite young. Uh, he tells the king when he goes before him to go up against Goliath that God had been with him when he was just a shepherd and watching over his sheep, and a, a lion came up to take of the sheep, and he grabbed the lion by the beard grabbed him by the hairs and faced him off. Uh, we're told in Scripture that when David was a, a child, a youth, just as a shepherd, he took on the lion, he took on the bear. Uh, we see that uh, he's everybody knows David because he took out Goliath. Even worldly things continue to refer as a, a David and Goliath moment when the 
the underdog takes out the big boy. Everybody knows and understands the name of David. And one of my favorite things about David, I put here on the screen for you, he is a wonderful example of you do not need to be perfect to be God's servant. That's right. God doesn't have perfect people. Um, oftentimes I've heard, why would God use somebody like that? What other choice does he have? We're all sinners. We've all got problems. And I love the life of David because, again, he's recorded as being one that was after God's own heart, but yet you see him mess up so many times, and yet God stays with him, and God continues with big ways. That's right. You can hear my wife, in big ways, David messed up. Adultery, murder, uh, covering up the murder, conspiracy. I mean, just the list goes on and on. At the, the ways that David messed up, but yet you see God continue to work with him. So here you have David at the end of his life. And you see all of these experiences that David has gone through culminate to this one moment. And he's going to pass on this wisdom to his son Solomon that was conceived out of wedlock, was the very conception of his sin. Uh, that's true. Thank you for correcting me on that. That's true. Got ahead of myself there. Yeah, that's right. The one conceived out of wedlock did die, correct. Sorry about that. See, this is why it's good for y'all to key in when I go to talking too fast. I get ahead of myself. So Solomon being his son, he's passing on all of this to him, all of his life experience and everything that he had gone through and everything he had seen and how God had continued with him when he messed up and how God had kept him how God had blessed him when he would listen and when he would do what God asked him to do. He has got all of this running through his head. He knows he's got this moment to speak to his son that's going to be his successor as king. And he challenges him. It's very clear here that this is a passing thought. This is a deathbed confession here. Oh, uh, can y'all, if y'all couldn't hear Brandy, uh, she was correcting me that uh, Solomon was not the one conceived in sin. It was actually his older brother that died uh, in, as an infant. Uh, she corrected me. I misspoke. So that's what she was saying. So, but uh, uh, you have David here. He said, he, uh, now the days of David drew nigh that he should die. Again, he's old and stricken in years. And here he's charging Solomon, his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. David knew well that no one in this earth is going to escape death. This is normal, son. This is not a moment for you to get lost and say, God's taking me from you. This is not a moment for you to get upset with God. This is a moment for you to recognize that this is just the natural part of life. I go the way of all the earth. Boy, he is just straightforward with him. I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. That's what makes me think of uh, quit ye like men. Yeah. Brandy says it reminds her of quit ye like men that you see in Scripture uh, multiple times. Quit ye like men. That doesn't mean give up. Quit means to stand up, strengthen, stiffen up. And to look to the definition, you can't quit something that's not finished. You got that for free. But he just flat out tells Solomon, man up. He, he's serious about it. Siri continues to think I'm saying her. Serious. He's serious about this. He's telling him to, to man up. 
to sure himself up, be ready. Uh, what you're going into, Solomon, is not easy. Remember, I'm, I want us to look at these final charges as a charge to us. Just look at my life and see how not easy it is. Exactly. Look at me. We're going to look at that here in just a minute in First Chronicles. That's basically what he tells him. So look on my life and recognize it. Uh, he, he's telling us that in this earth, you're going to have problems. You're going to have troubles. This is going to be hard. And Solomon, you're going in to, to be a ruler. You're going in to be a king. And this is not going to be easy. You're going to have to man up. You're going to have to grow up. And that's something that uh, is not not you know just to put it plainly that's not taught too well today and no offense but that's not taught too well today and it's thought of as degrading by many people and as an insult when you get told to man up to grow up but the reality of it is scripture teaches we need to grow up but there's no room for being a child when you're an adult it's time to man up it's time to grow up that's, that's kind of the charge that David has given Solomon. And it probably would have done Solomon well if he'd have listened. You can look at the life of Solomon and see that he's like a lot of us. He takes a while to actually do that. But that's basically what David is telling him here. And you see it a little bit more clear in the way I, I like to look at it in First Chronicles. First Chronicles chapter 28 you have this recorded again where he is charging him before all of Israel. And he's, he puts it very plainly here as well. 28 and 20. And David said to Solomon, his son, be strong and of a good courage, and do it. Let's back up just a little bit so we can get the context here. Part of it, yes. In verse 19, All this, said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me, even all the works of his pattern. And David said to Solomon his son, Be strong and of a good courage, and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee, until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. Here we see the charge given again uh, in the context of building the, the temple. This seems to be a theme that David is trying to get across to Solomon to do it, just plainly put, do it, don't quit. This is the, the passing charge of David to his son Solomon and by the inspiration of God from David to us. Be strong and of a good courage and do it. We all have those in our lives, I, I pray you do anyway, those that you can look at, that you can look back on and see in their lives that God has been with them, that God has provided, that we can see those examples. Uh, maybe we can look back on our own lives and see when I did what God said to do, it was just like scripture said, and he blessed me, and when I turned away from it. It didn't go so well for me. We, to some extent, if I can be uh, so bold at it, we're somewhat without excuse. We've been given full revelation of God. We have so many examples in Scripture of what we're supposed to do we need to listen to the charge of David and do it. And know it's not easy. And growing up's not easy. And manning up is not easy. 
And if you need to hear it, womaning up's not easy, however you wish to see it. Um, it's, it's not easy doing what is required of us, but that does not remove the burden from it being what we're supposed to do. Well, it's contrary to the world and what they say, so. Right. Especially for the younger ones, and it makes it doubly difficult on them because they're being told the exact opposite. Right. Uh, Brandy is saying that it's quite contrary. Uh, the teachings of God is, are, is very much contrary to what the world teaches, especially to the youth. The youth is not taught to grow up. It's not taught to be mature. It's not taught to uh, take responsibility for itself. It's always somebody else's fault when something's not right. Uh, that's, that's so foreign from Scripture, it's not even funny. We all have been taught and been told, and God has given us his word for us to be able to understand this, and will we continue on? Just like I have there on the screen. That's the charge from David to his son Solomon, is will you continue on? Will we man up and do it? Will we quit ye like men? That's right. The next one and the last one that I want to look at is found in Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now this is by no means a comprehensive study of the charges found in Scripture. Uh, there's far too many of them for us to cover them all. This is just kind of getting the high angle view of it and just getting a few of them that I think you can find a common thread through them all. You didn't do one of my favorites, so. <laughs> yeah, Brandy's saying that I didn't do one of her favorites. Um, she wanted me to do Ecclesiastes, and Ecclesiastes is very much a, uh, a parting term, and it's all part of it. We can't get them all in here. There's, there's a whole lot more that we could study through this. Uh, Sister Nelda says, even when our employers want us to work on a church day, we have to stand up. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that one is one that is so easily fallen away from. What seems like a very small battle is can have huge implications on your life. Uh, if you'll just, from day one in a job, stand up and say, Sunday morning, I'm not going to be here Wednesday, you can forget it. I, I've got church. And just stick to it. That's right. Very much so. It's very true. Do it. <laughs> you know you should. And I hope through all of this mess and being forced out of the church house, it's left us longing for it and, and yearning for it. I really look forward to the day we get back in there, and I hope that we can tell that everybody is looking forward to it. We'll hug from a distance. Well, we'll hug from a distance. This is true. <laughs> but here in Second Timothy, uh, we have Paul's charge to the ministry as a whole, directly towards Timothy, uh, his son in the ministry, but it's very much for the ministry as a whole, but I want us to see it's for each one of us as well here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 6. It says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Can you imagine being able to say that confidently on a Sunday morning? Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I could. Yeah. Brainy's saying, can you imagine um, being able to say that at the end of your life? And I've heard people call Paul out on it and say that's awful arrogant of him. I, I don't think it was. And he 
he mentioned so many times in scripture uh, how he was the least of the apostles and he had done hurt against the church. It's not an arrogant statement chief at all. Yeah, he's the chiefest. Uh, you know, Lord forgive sinners of whom I am chief. Uh, Paul knew he was a failure in places and he knew that he had messed up, but Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love the study of the life of Paul. It's infinitely deep. But there's one thing about Paul that it is, and we'll go to it here in just a minute in Philippians, that he, he knows that he messes up and that he has messed up, but he stands in confidence at this point. It's just notice says, my mom was like that. Uh, I'm, I'm a little behind on the comments. I don't know like what, but I'm uh, standing for God. I hope so. Uh, at the end of her life, maybe. But uh, it, it's a great place to be at that. Um, Paul knew that though he's not perfect, he's not like he was. And that's a wonderful place for us to get ourselves to recognize that we're not perfect, but we are better than we were. See, the previous two, I've got there in, on the screen for you, the previous two died of natural old age. Paul didn't have that luxury. Confident to die, Sister Nelda says. Absolutely. What a blessed place. And it's a blessing to the family to see that as well. The previous two, uh, being David and Joshua, they both died of an old age, natural causes. Paul didn't have that luxury. Uh, he died in prison. He died a martyr's death. So he didn't have that luxury. He the world would uh, excuse him of being someone who's angry at God. The world would say that uh, he has every right to be upset because where he was at. The world would try to use him as an excuse to say there is no God. Look at how you've served him, preacher. Look at how you have uh, stood for him and preached even to the king that was fixing to kill you, and God's not helped you. But rather, Paul comes to the end of his life. Or that he's not good. Mm -hmm. Even if they didn't yeah. try to go so far as to say that God's he not didn't real. Exist, you know, he must be a hypocrite. Yeah, he's not good. And, you know. Yeah. The world would use him to try to tear him down and to tear God down. But rather, Paul comes to the end of his life where he knows he's coming to the end of his life. He knows he's not going to leave Rome. And he's just, he's fine. He's ready. He's at peace. <laughs> That's right. He's ready to go. But look at the life of Paul. Hmm? It's a charge. We'll get to it. Look at the life of Paul. I want you to go back and read one section in Philippians with me. There in Philippians chapter 3. I want you all to know who Paul was. Because we've been able to look at the lives of all these other men and recognize their their life coming together here at the end for, to know where they're coming from. And you have the same thing with Paul. Here in Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 4, it says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. 
But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things that do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Paul had lived in a, an amazing life. He had come so far, and you see that at the end of his life. Paul has come to a point, he had come from being the, the Jew of a Jew, I mean, he was the chiefest. He was a Pharisee seeking to destroy the Lord's church, or this so-called Lord's church, as they see it. Blameless. Blameless. And that's a bold statement. When the law was meant to hush the mouths of people, Paul says concerning the law, I'm blameless. But he's the Jew's Jew. He comes from that to his livelihood being changed forever on a road to Damascus. Everybody knows this story. We don't have to go read them all. But you see him coming from the arrogance and the height of Judaism of being a Pharisee to going on a road to Damascus and having everything about his life completely and utterly changed. Yeah, that's true. The epitome of pride comes before fall. He's the height and pride of, of being the Pharisee, knocked into the dirt by Jesus and comes out of it completely and utterly changed throughout the rest of his life. And he's used mightily by God and he's still remembered to this day. What an amazing life. But he comes to the end of his life and says that through all of it, he's seen God move. He's seen God work. He says, I'm ready to go. I'm at peace. And he's talking to his son in the ministry, Timothy. He's charging, them, charging him to continue with a blessed promise that I have finished my race, I've finished my life, and there awaits for me now a crown that will be given to me on that day. This is not an exaltation to Paul. This is the beauty of what comes for all of God's people. At the end of this life, it's coming for all of us, one way or another, the end of our life is coming. For God's people, at the end of this life waits a glorification that we can't wrap our mind around. Death is just the beginning. This is the charge. Brandy was asking, how is this a charge? This is the charge. He's charging Timothy, I've come to my life and I've come to this point and I die in peace today because I know I have worked for Christ. And Christ says, for those that work for me will be blessed. And he's telling him that if you continue, you too will be blessed. Here's the charge from, Timothy, from Paul to Timothy. God will be with us. What a blessed thing to find at the end of his life. So fight a good fight, stay the course, and keep the faith. That's right. We can see a theme that is clearly throughout Scripture, and that is to serve the Lord. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Do it, and God will be with you. That's the and Ecclesiastes. Says, the end of the, the matter. The conclusion of the matter. <laughs> love God and keep his commandments. For That's this right. is the whole duty of man. That's right. Mm -hmm. Ecclesiastes. This is the whole duty of man. Mm -hmm. That's right. But all three of them come together in this simple charge that if we could live up to, our life would be completely changed. It starts with a choice. It continues with commitment. 
and you have the blessed hope that God will be with you through it all. So parting words and a charge for life. I challenge you to go through Scripture and continue looking at, uh, at those and learn from them. I want to thank everybody for your comments. I'm thankful that they've been on there. I'm thankful for everybody that's been joining in, seeing the views come up and uh, seeing everybody around. Do greatly appreciate it. Um, for our congregation, uh, our planning a, a Zoom meeting tomorrow night at 7.30. So we'll send out the invite to everybody. Hope to see everybody there. Just kind of a fellowship. See how everybody's doing since we're still quarantined away from each other. That being said, as I've got there on the screen, May 3rd, we, I plan to be back at the church. Lord willing that the counts stay low and things continue on the course that they're on right now. May 3rd, I plan on con, uh, going back to regular meetings at the church. The rules and regulations are posted there for you to see. There'll be no handshake before or after. And I know that's hard for us old Baptists but we're going to keep our hands to ourselves. We can, we can salute or, you know, bump elbow arms. bump or we're going to keep our hands to ourselves. There'll be no lunch. Again, hard for us to old Baptists, but we'll, we'll go without the lunch. There'll be no handshake. And if you are not well, may you stay home. If you are feeling sick or been around someone who's been sick, please stay home. But Lord willing, May 3rd, we'll, we'll go back to regular worship in the church house. And I hope you're all able to be there. We will continue the live streams for those that are unable or feel uncomfortable to meet. It is perfectly okay if you feel uncomfortable being there. Completely understand there's a lot going on, and it's a serious thing, so it's completely understandable and okay if you're uncomfortable meeting. We're going to continue the live streams from there. Hmm? No, we're not going to come hunt you down. We're not going to form a committee and see why you weren't in the congregation that weekend. It's okay if you're uncomfortable meeting. But as for me, I, I plan on being back in there May 3rd. And we will can pick up with regular meetings, at least on Sunday mornings. Wednesday nights, we can still uh, discuss on how we want to do those moving forward. But Sunday mornings, I plan on being back in the church house. I want to thank everybody again for uh, coming in and catching at least a piece of this, taking part, uh, share it, comment. And I look forward to seeing you all later. Uh, if you would, I'd like to go to Lord Prayer dismissing us. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we, we thank you once again. I pray, Lord, that this has been honoring to you in some way. I pray that we've learned from it. Lord, please be with each one that's on our hearts and minds. Be with this nation. Be with everyone that's been affected in all the many ways this virus has affected us, with or without the sickness, Lord. It's affected us all. Forgive us of our sins and help us to come together and shine your light as we should and Help us to use this as a chance to do so better. Above all, Lord, I ask that you bend us to your will and your will alone. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you all again. God bless you and come see us at Salem Primitive Baptist Church in Damascus, Arkansas. Good night.